Roxo Media House. Welcome back to Fortitude, folks. Today is a special one. I am sitting in the presence of a guy I've known for a long time, a man named Rusty Reed. Welcome to the show, Rusty. Thanks, JW. Fortitude is brought to you by the folks at Captex Bank. Thank you, Mike Thomas. We know you're watching out there every day religiously, so thank you for your through time and your sponsorship. But uh, Rusty uh, he's here today for a lot of reasons, particularly one big one. Higginbotham, his company that he's been running for so long, is turn, turning 75 years old. Happy birthday, Hig. Thank you. There but, we go. But before we get into the juicy stuff, let's talk about you a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. Your childhood. Uh, where were you born? So I was born in, uh, actually born in Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas. Okay. Don't okay. tell, you know, I know we're in Fort I won't Worth, tell so I have to be careful about that. Fair enough. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, if you, if you don't mind, what, sure. you, what, you can, uh, what you can tell us. Yeah, so sure, happy to. So uh, grew, uh, born in Dallas, uh, had a little brother, have a little brother, uh, Brian, uh, that I grew up with, who's kind of my sidekick. Uh, like many people, unfortunately, my folks ended up getting uh, divorced at a pretty young age. I think it was like nine, but uh, grew up living over in an area called Medallion uh, Shopping Center. And so mm-hmm. back in the old days where I went to the same elementary school, Dandy Rogers, for seven years. And then they kind of shipped us over to what was at the time called Ben Franklin Junior High. Uh, Same building turned into the freshman Hillcrest Center. So I went there and then Hillcrest High School. So uh, anyhow, long story short, kind of spent all my informative years in uh, uh, Dallas and was actually headed to University of Texas, which uh, as much as I loved the Longhorns, I'm glad I had a little diversion, kind of a sad story, but it, a good, it, nevertheless, I'm not the only fall in this category. So get accepted, to go to UT. And unfortunately, my dad passes away. My folks were divorced, but dad passes away. Mm-hmm. So my grandparents uh, encouraged me to stay close to home. So I thought, well, I'll just go to SMU. Uh, and they quickly explained to me that that wasn't in the budget. Now, the JW, the comical part about it, this is I paid for my own way to go through school. So I still, I guess when you're young, you don't kind of connect those dots. Uh, but I had a, a bunch of great friends of mine uh, going to North Texas. And mm-hmm. so I kind of followed that uh trained at UNT, or at that time, North Texas State University, which, which, by the way, headed to Vegas, I don't know if you noticed, to play in a little NIT semifinal. Yes, I did. Um, But uh, went to North Texas and really kind of set the trajectory of my life, which actually ultimately brought me to Higginbotham. So Mm -hmm. I, I, I met my wife there, Molly, who we've been married for quite some time since 1985. Right. Uh, Wait, went, let me work, check my notes, Rusty. Yeah, that yep, that yeah, checks yeah, out. I got yes. the dates right. Yes. Uh, work, actually, uh, one of my colleagues today was a fraternity brother, a guy named Ed Coker, when he was moving on for graduation to go work for a company called American General mm-hmm. down in Houston. Uh, he worked for an agency there in Denton called Raymond King and & Menace, and because I was still paying for my schooling uh, he encouraged me to take that job and I was like absolutely Mm -hmm. and so really a great great mentor of mine was a gentleman named Terrell King and he was one of the principals and so I got to work there kind of the junior year half a junior year and all my senior year and then upon graduation he was very generous with his time and and made a point to line me up with really three different job opportunities, which I landed on at American General, and that's what led me uh, to Houston. Sure. So I worked down there upon graduation, and then I was at a – in our industry, they have uh, kind of industry conferences mm-hmm. based on the Independent Insurance Agents of Texas. And so I was working the conference trying to get independent agents and brokers to sell our product, and the, the president of – American General at that time, a guy named J.D. White came to me and said, uh, you know, I'd love to have you uh, come back to the Metroplex because I know that's where your home was and don't have a spot for you in Dallas, but I have a spot for you in Fort Worth. And I said, of course, naturally, yes, sir, I'm happy, happy to take that on. And he said, if you mess it up, uh, you're going to Baton Rouge. So it kind of (laughs) became my uh, motivation to certainly do well. And so I came to Fort Worth and, and my job was to build out this market um, and the the gentleman that I became very fond of was a fellow named Bill Stroud, who right. was the nephew of Paul Higginbotham, mm-hmm. the founder of 
Higginbotham, and uh, he encouraged me to join the business, and I did that December of 86, yes. and as I like to say, the rest is history. So, And before we get a little further into the Higginbotham, yep, yep, yep. so you said you pay, help pay for school, by or you pay for school by your own efforts. Was this selling insurance for the original, or what were you doing to no, pay so the bills? No, great, so great question. So upon my dad's passing, uh, he, he had a number of rental properties, and so my little brother and I, as the joke would go, we'd help... Uh, help him work on rental properties almost as the maintenance guys the paint guy whatever it may be and uh if we did really well we got to have a free lunch and if we did good the second half of the day we got to have a free dinner um but but upon his passing my other grandfather was in the advertising business and he he knew that i knew how to paint pretty well and so uh, we created reed brothers painting really and so we we uh passed out flyers up and down montgomery mm -hmm. or uh, mike montgomery mockingbird there in highland park and landed a number of jobs so putting my way through school i i had the opportunity to paint homes i had the opportunity to um Worked for National Health Studios up in Denton, who, by the way, was run by now the now Stacy McDavid. So mm -hmm. she was my boss, and we always giggle about that when we see one another. And uh, and then I also worked at uh, Ramey King and Menace. So I ultimately, by the time I got close to graduation, I was only working That's one fantastic. job. That's fantastic. Thank God. That's fantastic. But, yeah. And so in 86, back to your where you left off, 86, you joined Higginbotham with Mr. Stroud, as you mentioned, as the 12th employee. That's what I have. Yeah, that's right. Notes. Yeah. So obviously it's a small company at that point. Uh, only a few years, short few years later, uh, in three years, in fact, you were 27 years old and you were named CEO and president of, of Higginbotham, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Please, for those that know you, and you know a lot of folks in this town, and everybody says really nice things about you, I assume you know that. You're a really nice, wonderful guy. But how does one become a CEO at such an early age of, a, of such a young company? What, what, led, what steps led to that, if you mind well, me asking? Well, that uh, I wish Bill was around. Uh, he had a lot of faith and confidence in me, obviously. Um, so it, it, it's probably important to note that the training that I received when I was at American General uh, was really very thorough and mm -hmm. and I remember one of my other colleagues at at uh, Higginbotham used to say because I'd always go to him and go why me I'm so young and, and he'd say Rusty you know when you talk about experience you have guys that have 30 years experience but it's just one year over and over and over mm -hmm. again he said you yeah you're newer newer to the industry but your experience is rather robust and it's it's full sure. and so when I was actually brought into Higginbotham uh, Bill had two underwriting programs one with a company called Crum and Forster and the, uh, one with the one called uh, uh, at Providence, Washington. And so my job was really to oversee that program. So we, at that time, we were, again, a, and, and I'll also, important to note, we were a tiny company. Mm -hmm. um, but but my job was to actually oversee the business insurance side of the agency, which, you know, was probably represented about 65% of that. Right. And um, he very quickly, I mean, and it's kind of my leadership style as well. I mean, he, he very quickly let me just kind of, grabbed the baton and I ran that. And then I kind of learned an early lesson. I had a, a, a one of the sales guys, I kind of had a little uh, a spat with is the nice way to put it. And I went in his office almost to be a little bit of a tattletale. And he very quickly reminded me that when I had numbers by my name, I even like I was producing, mm -hmm. not just overhead, I could come in and uh, have a much louder voice. And so I, because of really my training that I had, had um, I, I really then kind of launched, I thought, you know what, I can run the, this side of the business, but I'm going to actually go sell and really probably my fondest day is when I passed this guy because he was the largest sales guy at the time. And so I think really the accumulation of my product knowledge, uh, you know, the fact that I, I had really already run mm -hmm. the largest part of our organization. And then on top of that, I was leading the firm in sales. I think it kind of became a decision that, and it was his call because mm -hmm. he owned 100% of the company, but um, he he was also, and, and I'll digress a second. I mean, 
you know, in life, it's always great to have great mentors. And when I reflect back on my life, and I'm not that old, you know, as you were there, I mean, they say 60s is the new 40, so I'm only 40. <laughs> um, but when I reflect back on my life, I've had some very, very wonderful mentors from from Terrell King at Ramey King and Menace to J.D. White at American General and then Bill. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had a lot of great mentorship to help me yes, once I was past that baton to run the firm uh it it was very very helpful and you know i'd never bought a company either and Mm -hmm. so that's the other thing that we did in 89 kind of in conjunction with me being anointed as the president and ceo that i had the the good fortune of signing my name on uh, the the dotted line which i still laugh about this today because i think i was molly and i rent an apartment at highland park apartments Mm -hmm. and we were leasing a volvo so it wasn't like i had any assets to pledge (laughs) right uh but as bill adams who was our banker at first city at the time said well no if this thing fails i'm gonna own you for life so i guess it gave me plenty of motivation to get after it but you know we bought the company through a vehicle called an ESOP, employee mm-hmm. stock ownership plan and trust. And and it, it was great for Bill and, and what he deserved. It was great for us as the buyers. Right. But more broadly, culturally, and it's really kind of who we are today as well, it allowed me to you – know, I'm, I'm just a very loyal person. You know this because uh, our personal relationship. And I really believe you danced with the ones who brung it. And I was sitting there thinking about, you know, we, we explored all kinds of ways to buy Higginbotham. You know, at the time, Bill was on the board of Bank of Commerce, and we went down and met with them to see maybe that I just would – He'd co-sign a note. When that note was paid off, I'd own the company. Mm-hmm. And and that that didn't sound like a good solution to me for a couple reasons. Number one, if I was the 12th employee, excluding Bill, there was 10 others that had been there before me. Mm-hmm. And it just didn't it just didn't feel right. You know, they were there getting that firm from, you know, Bill when he took over to where it was when I walked in. And so I didn't like that, truth be told. And of course the ESOP meant everybody was gonna own the mm-hmm. company. So that was a great solution. Um, and then the other thing that 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 I saw in in my you know short time a couple of years with American General was that if you didn't have ownership in the agency, oftentimes if you know the guy in the corner owned it and you're their top sales guy, you just pack your bags up and you'd start your own company and become a competing uh, firm, right? right? And so I thought if we're gonna a, retain the people we've got, but more importantly, attract people and then have people stay with us. Give them some we need to we need to give them ownership. I think that's one of the things that I, I love about the, the company is that it's employee owned. Um, I think you talked about. Uh, well, if I could digress for one second, please. Your sales your sales style. Uh, it's very clear you're you're very good at selling things, and that's one of your secrets to your success. What make what makes you would you say a, a good salesman in, in this world? So I think that's a great question, and and I always advise my young people, um, because I'm now 40, I'm I'm probably one of the younger, (laughs) but uh, here's just the fact of any industry. I think you can have great people skills, and you'll do okay. Mm -hmm. You can be very technical, and you'll be okay. I learned kind of early on, you need to bring those together in the middle, and so I've always prided myself on really being a student of the industry, being very technically proficient, uh, but also to mirror with that, you know, people skills, right? Be, and, and and it's that's not hard, right? You're you being a male. I I'm always want to be a gentleman. I want to be mm-hmm. very respectful. Uh, I want to certainly, if I say I'm going to do something, by God, I'm going to fall through and yes, do sir. it. I think what what people know about me is that I if, if I if I commit, I'm all in. I'm mm-hmm. not just going to you know, go haphazard at it. And I'm, I'm naturally very competitive, unlike you and my son, Charlie, and even Jake. And I mean, I was, I was athletic, but I wasn't certainly going to play at the next level. What but sports? I, uh, are you, why I, you mentioned football that? and, and, uh, also was a pole vaulter, believe okay. it or not. So I, I kind of got to do those two sports and love both of them. Um, my, my problem is I'll digress a second. I, when in practice at Hillcrest, I happened to go up against a guy that was six six, guy named Ricky Bolden, that went on to be part of the Pony Express and a very <laughs> successful career with the Cleveland Browns. And then one of our competing uh, 
uh, teams we played against always was Thomas Jefferson, and they had a little guy named Michael Carter mm-hmm. who went on, of course, to have n- not only be a, a wildly successful football player at, at, at SMU, and I, I think went on to the Chicago Bears, but he also was a world class shot putter. In the Olympics, I, I, actually, yeah. I actually spent a lot of time with him because SMU was so close to Hillcrest. They were generous enough to let a lot of the ISD kids go there and work out. So I worked, when I pole vaulted, nice. I actually went there to practice because we didn't have that facility. And of course, it amazes me this day to thinking about Michael Carter literally as a high schooler mm-hmm. was out shot putting all the guys at SMU. Absolutely. You know? So, but anyhow. Yes, um, so you, the, another thing that's what's lovely about Hig is that it's, and this is one of the things I've heard and I've read several times, but it's a single source uh, service model is, is what I think you've told me this yourself, but you you want and I think that means just so we're I'll get this uh, right. Everything that you would ever need for an in, in insurance needs should come through one person in one place. Is that kind of what a single yeah, service model? Yeah, that's J Dub. Perfect. Yeah, and, and, and I'll tell you. I mean, I I. I, I I'm the one here on the mic today, but you know, it, it takes a village to build what we've built. And, and it's certainly early days, you know, which are still very much part of who Mm -hmm. we are today. You know, we early on, as I began to get more in the client facing side of the business, I had people coming to me going, don't you have somebody that does benefits? And, and candidly, I did not at the time. I had a wonderful person, a guy named, uh, 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 John Park, who was with Time Insurance, and he he kept pounding me. Listen, I can help you, you know, broaden your business and do employee benefits. And so, um, I, I I took his took him up on his offer, and we landed a couple of wonderful accounts. And I very quickly picked up the phone and called my uh, pledge brother and dear friend Jim Hubbard, who at the time was working for New York Life, and said, Jim, I think. The demand is really here. I said, I think we're sitting on a gold mine. We're predominantly a property casualty firm, uh, and and people are really wanting us to kind of manage other parts of their business. At that time, we did their business insurance and then their personal, think auto home, right. that kind of thing. And so we added that line of business. Uh, and then shortly after him joining me in April of 89, uh, and we buy the business in June of 89. Along comes Michael Parks, who was actually one of my first social friends. And mm-hmm. Michael was working for Connecticut Mutual. And so what we they, they kind of started originally what we called our life and health department, um, which became a nice bolt-on. And, and we very quickly found that clients really did. They We, we kind of thought about, and back to my kind of technical side, mm-hmm. you know, you can't be a jack-of-all-trade and a master none in our industry because you're, you're managing people. People's assets, their health care, potentially their estate planning, et cetera. And so that really kind of broadened our efforts. And both of them were life insurance guys, but then they even came and said, hey, we need to have life insurance experts. And then they found themselves working on retirement plans. And they're like, we need to get retirement plan mm-hmm. experts in here, predominantly for 401k, but, you know, uh, other retirement uh, vehicles um and then you know it broadened and it's like you know a lot of these clients need hr support right um most mid-market companies which we kind of define you know 10 employees to really 2000 you know oftentimes you play a very active role in kind of being an extension of their bench right Mm -hmm. and so we added hr and then then we had clients coming to us going, hey, we need help with loss control to make sure we have safe work environments. And so we very quickly began to broaden our scope and provide a lot of ancillary services right. like loss prevention and brought attorneys on staff to, to help do uh, not only risk mitigation, but to help do contract review and claims adjusters and wellness people and, and, and. So really, I, I would tell you what's been a fun thing to watch from from my seat is just we we're just we do a great job of listening really what clients need and then just saying because we're privately held you know we, we're like okay what can we do to best surround the client and hence became the single source model right Absolutely. we put the client in the middle build professional disciplines around that client so we could so they know they could come to us but we could be their single source as it related to their insurance financial services and hr needs if you will sure. and, and that's that's kind of been our model you know really from the get-go we've just kind of expanded those services absolutely and business offerings that's wonderful for comparison so when you started in 86 with this 12th employee 
till now, how many employees does Higginbotham uh, cr- claim? Well, uh, that's always a good question because it's always a moving target. Um, but in a, in a positive way, I might add, um, I think we're close. To, I think the reported number we like to use now is 2,500. Uh, believe it or not, that that does change daily because sure. back in 07, we kind of deployed what I call a dual growth strategy. So we've always grown very much organically. We had a lot of people that wanted to buy us to build out Texas and you know we as I like to say we may be done but we're not stupid we're like well I build it out for you guys we'll build it out for ourselves so we we kind of developed a partner strategy mm-hmm. in legal form to make acquisitions to bring on sure. to our team but then kind of hypnotize them get them doing mm-hmm. business the way we do in business and and so our organic growth adds a lot of employees but so does our sure. uh, partnership strategy so and when you know when I started we were kind of one office 12 employees right here in one city Fort Worth Texas and today we have I think about 87 offices right. spread over 15 states and I and and I'm going to just I'll I'll use 2500 uh somebody might correct me if I'm too high or too low but that's probably a good ballpark do you ever think back to the 86 89 days and and look at look look at it now and what is what does that make you feel like if if you if you ever have those thoughts oh well, we we think about it all the time and 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 I, I say we cuz many of us when 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 I came to to Hig and really our home for Higginbotham from 86 to really 97 uh, when we moved our, our current location, part of the business did, and then the balance of the team moved later. But we, we, it was Bailey Street, so we were right there on the corner of uh, Bristol and Bailey. And so we always, when we all talk, you know, at the water or at the water cooler, it's always like ah, back to the Bailey days. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we we and 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 I will tell you that's the the thing. Sometimes I think some of our smaller competitors like to throw stones at us, and 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 but you know we we are a we were still uh, we were named very wonderful accolade uh we were we've been named best place to work a lot not only in terms of local markets but the state of texas and even on a national scope and one of my colleagues in the interview at the time we've, we've grown since this interview and it wasn't that long ago but his comment was and i think this holds true to culturally what we try to preserve he said even though and at this interview we had a thousand employees so we've doubled plus that but he said he he was number 30 coming into Higginbotham. He said, even though we have a thousand employees, I still feel like we're a 30 person company. And what that means to me is we've got at 2,500 employees. And because of our size, we have all the resources to work very much on a global basis, uh, leverage in our single source model, Mm -hmm. but we still can be very local. And that's really what we are. Every one of our offices are in communities where we can, we can be high touch. And I think in the world that we're in, you know, uh, not that we're not digital and we don't have some incredible technologies Mm -hmm. that we leverage with our client base and our employees, but being local, I think, I I think in our industry, you either have to subscribe to the theory that you're, you know, you're, you're kind of an order taker or you really subscribe through your people business. Mm-hmm. And I, I take it a step further. We're a people business and we're really all about relationships. Absolutely. And so we've tried to build our footprint in parts of the country where relationships really do matter. Yes. And obviously starting in Texas with, you mm-hmm. know, Texas roots, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of what permeates sure. as we expand outside of the footprint. of Texas. So much so that you've built uh, this company with, with your employees uh, to the largest independent insurance agency, in the state of Texas and 20th in the country still still the numbers yes right? yeah and, and we uh is your you know, is your goal is your goal well, still to the, keep the, going I mean I would tell you you know we, our goal isn't to to be the biggest um we really focused on more being the best mm-hmm. um and 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 I think because we focused on being the best we've actually gotten quite large I mean mm-hmm. most people don't realize this but if you look at the independent agency system there's approximately 35,000 independent agents and brokers in the country and 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 many of them that are larger than us have a full national footprint where we're only in the lower part of the u.s so um if you know if they let me cheat and say well if i was in all across the country i'd actually be bigger than you guys but it's really not about that it's i always say everything in our lens ties back to our mission vision and values you know our our mission says we want to exceed expectations of our constituencies which are our employees our trading partners our our uh 
certainly our clients in our communities, mm-hmm. our our mission, our vision statement says we just want to be best for all of them. And then our value statement says we want to be family to our employees, we want to be complete advocates for our clients, partners with our carriers, and then generous to our communities. And so, you know, nowhere in that obviously says we want to be the biggest. Mm-hmm. It's just been, well, you know, it's funny. We looked up in 07. We were the largest firm in North Texas. I don't know when we became the largest in Texas. And, you know, one day if we become mm-hmm. the largest in the country, great. But I'm the things that matter to me, and I know my partners, is more about, you know, having great retention of our clients, great retention of our employees, you know, really being fulfilling our mission to be generous to our communities um, and and being, you know, in our industry. You know, the reason why our insurance companies, some people refer to them as vendors or just the carriers, but we really want to be partners and kind of back to that Southern hospitality. We've learned through the years, if you treat them well, it's what my grandmother taught me, right? Rusty, you treat people with kindness, you're going to get a lot more in return than if you, you know, strong arm them. And I can't tell you, JW, how many times we, on behalf of our clients, have been able to take what's a really tough situation. And because we've got great relationships with our cl- with our insurance companies, get things done that nobody else gets done. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally. And um, that's, you know, so, so that, has helped us grow sure. a lot. Um, it's helped us keep some incredible employees, mm-hmm. helped us keep some incredible clients, helped us land some amazing mm-hmm. new clients. Um, but, you know, it's, I always say it's a three legged stool. It's kind of us, it's the insurance company, you know, mm-hmm. team, and it's always our, uh, our client. And it, what the magic is, how do you keep mm-hmm. all that working well and in harmony? Right. So anyhow, well, we're celebrating the 75th, uh, birthday of Higginbotham. You've been at the helm for more than half of that. Uh, from then till now, can you talk about any of the, the major struggles that you've overcome throughout that time? I mean, everybody running a business in this world takes a lot of a lot of work, a lot of efforts, and a lot of failures in some regards. Uh, certainly, you've seen your share of of struggles and hurdles you've overcome. Is there anything you could share with us? You know, it's funny. I used to say, and it, it's almost true. I, I'm hoping I've when 2030 rolls around, I'll be able to pass the baton to somebody else. Cause if I just follow my history with Higginbotham on every even decade, so think 1990, mm-hmm. think 2000, think 2010, think 2020, my, oh my, n- there's no rule book to explain how you get through this. And I'll, I'll go through them quickly. So in 19, you know, we buy the business in 89 in 1990, we look up and we are losing our riches. I mean, we, we and, and it's like what you see often a company that had no debt all of a sudden has debt. Um, people, you know, we were pretty comfortable as an organization because we were a successful business. Mm -hmm. Um, but now we have debt and now, you know, you kind of had to carry your weight. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had to, we, we, we had to make some really hard decisions to, to right size our, our expenses. And, and, and fortunately we did, and we lost nobody. We, for us, it wasn't a function of let's go put a bullet in a lot of people. Uh, that's never been my leadership style. Um, I've always been a fan of let's grow the top line, everything, if, if grow the top line and build it as it comes versus building it and hope it comes mm-hmm. has always been my strategy. And so 90 was a, we were small and tiny, but a very challenging year. And what was even more comical is I went to Bill Stroud and and I go, oh my gosh, we're going to have to do boom, boom, and boom. And he's like, well, it's your business now. You figured out. So, you know, at, at a young age, you had to grow up quickly, mm-hmm. roll the clock forward. You know, in 2000, we saw the dot com boom, but yep. we also saw a horrific dot com bust and we we had a web business that we were involved in and a lot of really tough times in and around that. But, you know, thanks to the team and I think some of the competitive spirit that I've just, you know, either I was born with or have had to, because of my, my, you know, informative years had to, to, to capture, I was able to kind of lead the charge through that, uh, you know, 2010, I mean, you know, the financial crisis hit in 08 and really things kind of went 08, you know, the market hit an all time low March of 09 and really 2010, it was a booger bear. And I, and of course I left out the, you know, I remember like it was yesterday, we were in our, our building we're in today when 9-11 hit. And, you know, I was on the 
on the phone with Michael Parks's wife and and she's like oh my gosh what do we do and I said I don't know but you need to go pick your kids up and you know take shelter and I remember bringing everybody in the atrium and saying having one of our he's deceased now God rest his soul but Morgan Woodruff you know say a prayer and try to calm everybody's nerves because you know they were bombing you know things that were you know related to the military and right next to us we had uh, a government office and so Mm -hmm. you know the the the, the, just not panicking and Mm -hmm. just trying to be calm but not knowing well last time this happened here's what you do uh so certainly 10 was an interesting time because of the hope and it rebounded from the financial crisis and then of course whoever knew the word COVID-19, right? And so uh, what an interesting day that was. You know, we, we, we were, I remember this thing all of a sudden became very real. And, and again, I did what I always did. I don't think I always have all the right answers. And so I quickly formed what we called the COVID-19 task force and said, how do we, you know, we, we don't have a rule book here, boys and girls. So we're going to have to figure this thing out. So mm-hmm. long story short, I'm sure there's been a zillion others that mm-hmm. it, anywhere in between, but you know, what, 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 what I think I learned in 90 was you don't give up. What I learned in 10 is you don't give up or in 2000, you don't give up same thing in 10 and same thing in 20. Mm-hmm. And, and I tried to, you know, now that I'm older, uh, again, only 40, but, um, now that I'm older, I've tried to really impress our audience upon, is laughing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, try to impress upon our team mates that, you know, guys, it, this too shall pass. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, nothing's ever guaranteed in life. This too shall pass. If you every day just try to do the right thing, you, you're, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so, uh, you know, I kind of a comical sidebar, Oh, Bill Stroud, one of his favorite sayings always was, he's like, Rusty, God takes God takes care of children and idiots. Aren't you glad we're idiots? <laughs> and so, you know, I can't help but when these tough times occur and then we find our way out out of them mm-hmm. i just hear him in my ear <laughs> making that little comment so you anyhow. mentioned you mentioned bill stroud several times uh I, I know there's a few more but could you tell are there any you have heroes in your life or i know you had bill as a mentor and some of these people throughout their insurance upbringing and even now but anybody other than an insurance man or a businessman that was ever your hero yeah well yeah of course i didn't get to spend as many years as i wish i could have but my dad clearly a, a great hero i was blessed beyond words to have incredible grandparents and mm-hmm. and and uh it, it was it's kind of funny i i, I tease and in, in jest with my family all the time because upon my grandfather reed's passing and upon my grandmother uh or grandfather jurgens which was my mother's uh, uh, dad's passing they both told their respective wives don't worry rest will handle everything so <laughs> I, I guess they 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 for some reason thought i make things okay so they were they were great people and then of course you know molly's dad is is you know get emotional but great guy yeah for sure absolutely and i know this yeah. man i have to agree with you for sure so big big dad you know it's it's uh it, it's you just feel blessed in life and not everybody gets this opportunity, but, you know, met him in 1981. And of course, you know, he played football at Auburn as did Molly's brother play football at, at North Texas under Hayden Fry in my first meeting with him. You know, I'm just a young preppy guy coming in from North Texas and I'm calling on his daughter and calling on Charlie, <laughs> little Charlie's sister. Mm-hmm. And first time I, I, I met him, I basically was welcomed with grunts like, Hmm. You know, and uh, I knew I knew I'd captured uh, the respect of him when I was leaving. So when when I got my first job at American General in Houston, I had Molly with me and my mother and we were going to drive down to Houston. And as as uh, we were pulling out of the driveway, uh, I hear this. Hey, Russ. And he's you know, he's a big man. We call him Big Dad for a reason. You know him. So, you know, what I'm talking about and I roll down the window and he reaches in the car and kisses me on the cheek. That was it. Not leaning over to Molly, and I go, "Well, I guess he likes me now." So, uh, but he's great. He's been a great dad, not just father-in-law, as is his wife Sissy to me. And and mo- more importantly, you know, you always know the impact people have on you because my kids, they, they he's an integral part of their lives as I am an integral part of their lives. So, you know, his grandchildren and really anybody he touches, mm-hmm. he's a very special man. I've been very blessed to have him in my life. Um, thank you for sharing. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
a little bit different subject, but you, you've grown so much over the years. Uh, and I, I know you've been off at people that called and asked wanting to buy your business. Hey, you should join up. We should merge all the things that happen during the course of a business's life. How do you, how do you stay independent all these years? How do you not go after the allure of the, of the big public prize perhaps, or I assume big companies have asked to buy you over the years. What, what is it about you and the company that makes you want to stay private is well, I, I do think, you know, the, the thing that's been so great for us, and I think this is great for our employees and it's mm-hmm. great for our, our clients and great for our carriers and our communities, is, you know, we answer to our shareholders, yes, but our shareholders are us, mm-hmm. right? And and we, we've, we've been very fortunate. We've had a wildly successful run, m- much greater than any of us ever, 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 ever envisioned. Um, and we've, we've set up, our, you know, we run a, a tight ship. Um, you know, we, we, we always run a very conservative operation and, uh, it's allowed us to be profitable and, and that profitability has allowed us to make distributions to our shareholders. And so oftentimes, you know, you have to sell your business because you're, you're not able to get liquidity and, 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 and many people, they build a business and it's time to ring the bell and get that liquidity. Mm-hmm. Um, and in our case, we, we've kind of solved for that. It's literally in 07 forward. Uh, and and then the other thing I would tell you is, you know, you have to sell your business when you don't really build backfill of leadership. And we've got, I mean, the, you know, much like Bill Stroud did with me, I kind of mm. took a chapter out of his book and 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 i've done the same i mean many of the young folks in our organizations have tremendous responsibilities and they've done incredible jobs so you know my and i say this all the time I, my hope is um that higginbotham truly is a legacy asset that you know 75 years from now it won't be you and it won't be me mm-hmm. but it might be your successor and be my successor hosting this interview because we we you know not to steal somebody else's tagline but we We've built Higginbotham to last, right. and and we and we've recognized the importance of all the constituencies in our business, what that really means and entails. And I, and I'll tell you, it's harder to do it that way than just get to a certain point, and ring the bell, and say we yes, all sir. won. But I, I, I think I think you know thus far our journey is you know we're i always tell people it's a marathon not a sprint mm-hmm. and i, I kind of personally feel we hadn't even passed the 5k marker so i think we got a great future ahead of us and, yes, sir. and i feel blessed to be at the helm and i feel blessed mm-hmm. having great partners helping me right. steer the ship you've won multiple awards over the years you know your company itself you know you're an insurance business america hall of fame uh, one of the most admired CEOs by Dallas Business Journal for Chamber of Commerce has given you an excellent excellence in leadership award. One of the most innovative agents in America, you know, and one particular one, National Multiple Sclerosis Society Funding Hall of Fame. That one caught caught my attention. The other things, I think we all can agree that it, they're warranted, and you've done a wonderful job. You give back to the community like no other. Uh, what what is the Multiple Sclerosis Society, why, and why is that in your in your life? So, a uh, great question. So. Early on, and, and you know, we we now have, the, of course, the Higginbotham Community Fund, but early, early on, one of my, it's still to date, a dear, dear friend and a great client was a guy named David Miner, and he at the time had Miner's uh, Lawn Care. Right. And, and so great, great friend. Uh, talk about a mentor. I mean, he... He was he he definitely made me uh, respect the fact that you better bring the best uh, solution to the table for a client. Mm-hmm. Uh, he reminded that not only annually but frequently. Uh, but David was also a great individual in the sense that here had been a community that had given to him and his family the opportunity to build a great business, and it, it rewarded him. rightfully so uh, very very well and so he was on the board of multiple sclerosis he was actually the board chair and i had shared with him i'd really wanted to get more involved at a philanthropic level just Mm -hmm. i i I just i kind of was wired like that Uh, you Mm -hmm. can't just build a business hence taking from the community you need to give Mm -hmm. back and he said rusty this is a great opportunity so i got involved um with MS, got on the board. They host the first event I kind of got involved in was what they called the Jiggle and Gelatin Slide, and I had the good fortune of a, a friend of mine, Dave Craddock, known as Kid Craddock, of the radio. He was he had his uh, radio show that was booming, yeah. so he was my MC for the event. And then for anybody out there that's a, a Barney fan, uh, one of our uh, dear dear friends, uh, 
uh, owned a, uh, Levine's department store. And so Damon King's daughter, Lauren King was on the Barney show. And mm-hmm. so she agreed to be our celebrity guest to, you know, ro- basically slide down in this vat of gel uh, into a vat <laughs> of uh, jello. And so we raised a lot of money for MS. Well, then the next thing they came to me and said, what else do you think you would like to do? And so we, we kind of constructed what we called the MS uh, mm-hmm. rodeo and concert and so a gentleman in town a guy named gary mckinney who's passed away now but his own mckinney toyota had multiple sclerosis and he said i think i can get the the north texas toyota dealers to not only contribute uh, a truck to auction off but i think we can we want to we'll make a big blast mm-hmm. out of this we'll come in as a large large a sponsor and so we basically put on thanks to philip shoots who uh was helped do the uh, prca rodeo uh and then thanks to my dear friend gary osier that uh, we hired Lori morgan who at that time was on fire and by the way she was dating troy aikman who's of course yes. a super bowl you know winner and it just was that perfect storm so we sure. we did basically a series of four of these and raised a tremendous amount of money for ms and so hence they they gave me that that's Great. That's great. So, so, if you ever st- if you're listening, you probably can tell that this guy's got a lot on his plate. Let's let's throw on this. You sit on several boards, Rusty. You're on the All Saints Episcopal School Board, Casa Manana Board, Davy O'Brien Board. Several, I think, or maybe have dropped off. But tell me if I'm wrong. But YPO, the World Presidents Organization, TCU's Board of Trustees, the Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers, which is a lot in itself. And then I see one here, Goosehead. Goosehead happens to be in this building. This is another insurance agency. Could, could I ask about these guys? Yeah, absolutely. They're, uh, by the way, a great success story. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark and Robin Jones are the founders of this business, and it's kind of in our kind of in our purview, but not really. They're they they kind of have built a business that's very technically uh, connected. Um, where they they took advantage of what I'll call the captive insurance space. So if you think of the likes of the all state state farms mm-hmm. uh, and farmers, where you you basically work for them, they saw because Robin the wife saw that she tried to do closings because she was in the mortgage banking industry and could never get a bindable policy at closing and that resulted in a delay of closing which sometimes means you didn't get it closed Mm -hmm. right and so uh, mark very brilliant guy harvard mba and and was a bank consultant and they have six children and i'm sure there was some discussion at the dinner table you need to get off the road and stay home so he 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 retired and said let me think if i can build a business model to solve for this so they they've built this incredible national footprint where they basically serve the mortgage lending industry to provide homeowners at closing and they've got a phenomenal business nice. that that does that well they also kind of figured out that the that because state farm is both a, a sales arm but it's also the insurance company well if you're with state farm and you're in fort worth texas and you get obliterated by one of our hail storms you might not be able to write you know, homeowners anymore. So you need a multi-carrier platform. Right, right. And so they also figured out, Hey, we can build a franchise mm-hmm. with this. Mm-hmm. So I felt very honored and uh, blessed to be invited to serve on their board. And it, and for me, I always look at, and you talk about all these boards, I always look at boards as an opportunity for me really for professional development. Mm-hmm. Um, it also serves as an opportunity for me to, to, to kind of see how other people do it. And maybe we can, take some of those things and apply it to our business. Mm -hmm. And so, but they're a a great family that owns it and they took it public. And so, you know, not that we're on a path to go public, Mm -hmm. but it's nice to see how a public company is run and operated and on the inside. And should that ever happen in our world, at least I can have a little view of what that looks like. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, Do you have, do you have much free time? My, most of my, I, I guess the good news, bad news is I'm, I'm not a golfer and I'm not a, uh, you know, I, I'm, I enjoy the outdoors, but I'm not a huge hunter. Uh, and so my free time kind of is, you know, I work at Higginbotham. I support and I go all in on any of the nonprofits mm-hmm. or, or different boards I entertain. And then, I, of course, as you probably surmise, I'm a big family guy. So uh, we've, we've been blessed to have three wonderful children, Sainty, 
course, he's married to Eric, and they have two uh, kids, uh, Molly Morgan and, and little Mick. And then, of course, my son Jake is married to Emily, his his uh, college sweetheart, and they have little Janie. So, by the way, Molly Morgan's three, Mick's one, and Janie's one. And then mm-hmm. Charlie, uh, you know, our little TCU football player, he's married to Sweet Michelle, and they have little JR who's one. So a lot of my spare time spent hanging out with them. That is wonderful. Uh, the future of HIG or the future of the insurance world as we get closer into this interview. Uh, do you see, I know your model's not going to change necessarily, but it said at some point you're going to pass the baton. Uh, but is, does the future of the insurance world continue in the same trajectory or is there, do you see any vast changes with the world turning yeah, like it is? Yeah, no, I, I think it, I think it, it you know, we, we won't be identical to what we look like today, no mm-hmm. ifs, ands, or buts, but I do think it's a, it's, matter of fact, you know, JW, it's, it's funny, we, when you go to colleges and universities, it's normally the longest line for employment is whatever is the next hot topic, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and you can think about what that was when you went to school. I can think about what that I, what it was when I went to school. I can think what it was like when my my kid, my adult children went to school, uh, colleges, and you know it's interesting. Insurance has always been there, and and when you kind of peel back the covers and you look at the industry, it's an incredible industry. Like all industries, though, you've got to adapt to change and modify mm-hmm. and and i would tell you uh, another thing that that why i love having youth in our organization uh is uh is you know they help also open your eyes to hey it's not just that way you need mm-hmm. to be thinking about it this way also and so you know i, I will tell you that we're going to become much more data driven in our industry uh and and thank goodness we're an industry that's been built on a lot of old legacy systems Mm -hmm. and so thank goodness for technologies like a a snowflake and others where you can build data lakes and it doesn't matter where the data was you can bring it in and then Mm -hmm. slice it and dice it for your utilization and so I, i i i can see us becoming very i won't say data purely data dependent because i think god gave us all this for a reason and mm-hmm. you need to be able to look at data and then figure out now what i do with that data mm-hmm. um but but no i think i think our industry is very vibrant um i think there's it's a great place to to work I mean, and literally spend a career um and we'll have to adopt and you know adapt mm-hmm. and change etc um but i think we'll be there at, at the long haul as well nice one might say, based on your, your resume, that you knew what you wanted to do from early, an early age. And I don't know many people in my life that I've met, but that's pretty phenomenal in itself. From when you were learning the business in, in college, I think in North Texas, you were studying insurance and business. And here we are all these years later, and you've done it, man. You've, uh, you've run a business for so many years. That the, staying, staying in your trajectory from, your, from the get-go is, is a hard thing to do, and I commend you for that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick little secret, though. I really, when I, of course, a little of this probably was like most kids. You you don't know what you want to do when you graduate from high school. And and most don't know that candidly when they graduate from college. And so, with my, of course, my dad's past, I had no idea what I was going to do. I was literally lost for a while. So, I decided I was going to go into pre-med and become a pediatrician. Okay. But I met this thing <laughs> called... Uh, 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 organic chemistry, uh, and, sure. and and fortunately, the the dean of the bi- the biology department, which was over pre med, pointed across the courtyard and said, "You need to go see Doctor Thornton over there." Mm-hmm. And so, fortunately, he he guided me down the business path and and insurance. I guess since my dad and my grandfather mm-hmm. both were in that industry, I thought, well, that might be a path I should follow. Yes, and so it all worked out. Beautiful. Any regrets over your career? No, not at all. You know, I, I really don't. I've, I've always tried to not be a guy that just walk or talks to talk, but walk the walk. And, and, uh, I, I just, I, you know, I, 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 I really don't have any regrets to be honest with you. You've, uh, you've met some really interesting folks over your life. People that would call celebrities, musicians, sports people, any, any particular favorites in, in during your life? Boy, I don't know. I've met a lot of, thanks to my kids. You know, obviously my daughter and 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 uh, son-in-law are in the entertainment industry, so they've they've opened some incredible doors. And actually, when I was on the, I, I'm uh, I was board chair at Casa Mignana, and we had a opportunity to meet some really fascinating uh, people 
kind of along the way. And I've always had this incredible fascination with musician. Uh, uh, my high school buddies will tell you we had what we called Rusty and the Razor. So I, I probably, uh, you know. That was my uh, next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I probably, you know, uh, I would never make in that industry. So thank God insurance did come along. But uh, I, I, I've always been fascinated with talent. And I've had a chance, you know, musical talent. And that's, that's truly from Broadway to, uh, you know, folks that are live on stage. And, and you know, I had a, I've had a chance multiple times now to meet a guy like a Lionel Richie and what's just incredible. And it just, you, you, you figure out why they're so good at what they do. Every time you meet him, you, it's like you're the only person in the room and we all have friends that, you know, you're here, but they're looking at everybody else. They don't really care that you're right there. Mm -hmm. Right. And this guy, man, he hones in, he's almost kind of nerve wracking because he's really talking to you mm -hmm. and you're like, you know, he's pretty famous. And what's incredible is here's a guy that's, you know, been at it for God, probably 50 years and he's 73 or so now or in, and he's, you know, he's still got it. So mm -hmm. it, uh, I've, you know, I've had a chance to meet him. I had a chance one time to have lunch with George W. Bush and just, it's, it was kind of incredible because here I am meeting with the president of the United States and, uh, he was, you know, having fun with the table next to us because they weren't paying attention. So every time they weren't paying attention, he'd wad up a piece of paper and throw it. At you know, <laughs> so it's it's nice to know that they 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 have that side to them, yeah. the human side, Surely. you know, if you will. And and then uh, you know, have met some wonderful coaches along mm -hmm. along the way too, some great baseball players. So it's been it's been fun. I like that kind of stuff. My yeah. my wife Molly likes to refer to me as fanboy. So <laughs> and and of course with Eric you know meeting you know taylor sheridan just what a you know, words can't even describe how yeah, yeah. unbelievably talented that guy is mm -hmm. so been really really cool very cool uh about this rusty and the razors bit you brought since you brought it up um is it still ongoing is is roxanne still in the, well, in the roxanne, repertoire you know it made a made a little appearance that my wife had a little birthday party as you know and uh <laughs> it made, he made a little appearance there so <laughs> For those that don't know, if there's ever a chance, a particular group, Top, who, by the way, I first hired back when we did the MS Rodeo in concert, uh, we, we hired them then, and when Molly and I celebrated our first 40th birthday, we hired him then, and he's just been part of our family for a long time. He's just been very generous to let me come up and sing a song or two with him. That's uh, so, great. Yeah, I, if I get that opportunity, I always, of course, have to take advantage of it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I've appreciated the time, Rusty, for sure. It's it's a phenomenal story. You're a hell of a guy, and I appreciate that. You've been a good friend to me and to a lot of people. You always helping people. Uh, the last question I like we like to ask our guest, uh, aside from family, no wife, kids, grandkids, none of that stuff. Do you have a best day of your whole life? Golly, the best day of my whole life. Oh, I don't know. I, I, to be brutally honest with you, I've had some incredible days of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, the, so many of, cause as I mentioned before, you know, my, my, my quiet time, if you will, spent with family. So the very memorable moments all coincide with them. So I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I just feel as a human being, I've been real. you know, I've had certainly some tragedy along the way and mm -hmm. you know broken being part of a broken family along the way but i think that uh you know all in all it's been pretty pretty darn good gig uh so. imagine your father that you spoke of would be pretty proud of what you've done it's uh and i know he's left a long time ago but if he was anything like you rusty he's probably a good guy so well thank, thank you. you thank you for being here it's been a pleasure and i've always enjoyed you so thank you rusty reed uh, thank you for watching uh, Fortitude, Rusty Reed from Higginbotham, 75th anniversary. Happy birthday. Thank you, my friend. Yes, sir. Roxo Media House.